Mitch, we're here. It's game week. Are you ready to talk some football? Yeah, ready to stop talking about it, even though that's what we're going to continue to do, but ready to see the action on the field, no question. Yeah, the cliche goes, the time for talking is done, but that's what we do is talk, so we're going to keep talking right. about it. Yeah, but we, we finally get to, to stop talking about previews and, and off-season news and finally get to talk about games and, and seeing seeing these players and, and these programs that we've been talking up. So ex- exciting times, no question about it. Talking Illinois high school football. If your goals are as high as you talk about, Tonight, tonight, you go out and just take one more step. It's a view from the West. And it starts right now! Welcome into View from the West podcast, the podcast covering Illinois high school football on the western side of the state of Illinois. I'm your host, Greg Armstrong, joined once again, as always, by Mitch Stormer. Mitch, we said it in the open. It's game week. It's game week one is here. It's time to get some football on the field. Yeah, you have been getting that itch here here in Ohio. They already started, so um, got the first first glimpse of of some teams, some local teams here uh, this past week. So, um, but finally, you know, not, not only uh, high school football that we'll talk about here in Illinois, college football starting, NFL starting up. So this is just the it's it's the best time of the year, as as we always like to say. But uh, you know, you got to start somewhere. Week one is here, and in a couple of days, we're recording on Monday, so in in four nights. Uh, who knows? Maybe something crazy will happen doing our first uh, instant reacts. I, I don't know. But uh, either way, it, the the games are here and uh, looking forward to another great season. Yeah, well, you mentioned the instant reacts. I'm planning on being uh, at WQAD on Friday night. So I'll go out to a couple games and probably end up back at the studio and uh, maybe record an instant reacts with those guys. I know we've gotten you uh, and Gal. Camille will be there as well. Um, yeah. I know we've gotten you uh, we've gotten you live on the phone before to do it. Well, maybe we'll have to figure out a way to get the technology in to get you in. But, you know, I thought maybe this year, maybe every other week, we can bounce back and forth. And some weeks you can be on the instant reacts and other weeks it'll be the score crew. So, uh, yeah. you know, we, we got to get you in because I think you, uh, you know, you sit on, on Twitter on the X all night on a Friday and then you need some outlet to talk right. about it. Yeah. So yeah, whatever, whatever works. I'm, I'm up late those nights. So you guys are too. So I'm, I'm right there with you. So whatever, whatever works best. Awesome. Well, it's exciting that we're even talking about it, that we're right on the verge yeah. of a start of a new football season. Of course, Mitch, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Breedlove Sporting Goods, Western Illinois' premier sporting goods store for uniforms, apparel, equipment, awards, and online team stores. They provide all the same sporting goods services that the big nationwide companies do, but with a faster turnaround and their uniform prices are a fraction of what you're used to. They offer name brands such as Adidas, Under Armour, and Nike, and they are extremely responsive with inquiries. With a primary focus on the western side of the state of Illinois, Breedlove Sporting Goods is the fastest way to outfit your team. Check them out on Facebook or at BreedloveSports.com. Or shoot Cal Breedlove an email. Talk to him directly. CalBreedlove at gmail.com. You can get your information there. So, Mitch, here we are. We have, can you believe, Mitch, I did the math today, somewhere near 55 high school programs that we discussed in the last two weeks. Yeah, quite, quite a bit. And, and certainly with uh, the new teams that came in with uh, the Lincoln Lamb Conference, it just adds to the, adds to the list. So, you know, some teams have, I've gone to different conferences, so that doesn't really count, but we, we seem to have added some more over the years. So yeah, the more the merrier. Uh, yeah, bring them on. The, the more the merrier and the more the homework is what it's been, but it's been great. It's yeah, been fun great. to add some yep. teams and we're now moving into the Peoria area with the Prairie, with the Lincoln right. land conference that we hadn't really, you know, we were talking a little bit about Elmwood Brimfield, Macomb, Farmington, but we haven't really gone that way. And Macomb's more kind of Quincy area, but, you know, now we're kind of expanding our listening area, which is fun. It's great. Well, and, and I, I mentioned that to you earlier tonight that sometimes we, you know, we can struggle to get some information on either some teams from the from the Lincoln land or, or uh, the, the prairie land as it used to be, Lincoln Trail. So I, I hope that I hope that we're kind of filling that void a little bit. Hopefully we have listeners from those teams, in those areas, because it seems like info is hard to get sometimes. So I'm hoping that, you know, this this opens uh, or, or we get some more listeners, too, from this, because, again, it seems like uh, those areas may not get all, always the best coverage, either from the, the Journal Star or a local outlet. So um, all, all the fans, certainly in that area, in any conference that we cover, 
uh, we hope that we provide that news to you and, and give you something to talk about. Yeah, Mitch, I will say that over the course of our, you know, podcasting here, if that was kind of an unintended um, positive to what we're doing. I, you know, as unfortunate as it is, the reality is a lot of newspaper staffs are getting smaller. And that means that some coverage of high school athletics is harder to come by. You know, you open, you know, you go to websites or open a newspaper on a Saturday morning. There's not nearly as many game articles anymore. It's just the fact. And that's really unfortunate. Through no fault of the local staff, they're doing the best they can, but there's management making decisions that are, you know, unfortunate for local coverage. And yeah, I'm proud to say that if we can fill some of that void and give some coverage, some highlight to these teams, that's great. That's, you know, that's what we're in for. That's what we're all about. Like we said, over 55 area teams covered. Our conference previews are done. The Western Big Six, the Three Rivers Athletic Conference, the Lincoln Land, the NUIC, and the eight-man ranks. We've covered all of it here. If you haven't listened to those yet, go back and listen to those episodes. They're available in the archives, as well as our season debut episode with Edgy Tim. They're all available. Listen to them. Podbean or anywhere you find your podcast. You can also go to our YouTube channel. We heard feedback from coaches from around the area. Some good, some like what we had to say, some that didn't necessarily care for everything we had to say. That's just fine. You know, Mitch, for me, if coaches around the area want to use us as bulletin board material, or better yet, even use us in a motivational speech in week one, hey, by all means, I, I think the fun part of the season right now is Every team gets a chance to go out and prove themselves and show us what they're all about. And guess what? If teams win, those are the teams we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about their accomplishments. Right. Yeah. And anything that can be taken from us as, as you know, bullets of material is an unintended uh, consequence of that. Right. Our, our goal is to spotlight these teams and these, these players um, we want the best for them. We, you know, I wouldn't be doing this podcast from 400 miles away if I didn't care about promoting Illinois football and these conferences that we cover. So, and uh, again, it's, it's not our intention to ever, ever become that, that bulletin board material, but we understand that it happens. And that's again, perfectly fine because we want these teams to win. Yeah. Yep. I think you kind of, you kind of nailed it is that, you know, we're going to get on here and we're not going to be able to say that every team's going to go nine and oh, that would, that would make for a very boring podcast. But I think that what's important to note is that we're never going to negatively criticize any program. We're certainly right. never going to call out individual athletes for a poor performance. You know, I learned a long time ago covering high school football is about spotlighting the positives in our local area. It's about focusing on the good things happening for our schools and for our athletes. At the end of the day, we're cheerleaders for the teams that we're covering, for all the teams we're covering. Yeah, no question. And, and like you said, that's those are things that we learned way back in the day at the or, origins of the Highlight Zone. And you can see all those area programs and how they kind of follow all that same recipe. Mitch, we both learned under Dan Pearson. How can we not be yeah. positive? You know, how can we not be champions right. of the positivity of, you know, high school right. football and area athletics, you know, learning under Dan right. Pearson. So, yeah, there's a guy that's excited about Geneseo football. I guarantee you that. Well, absolutely. Well, we'll get into that in a minute here. Well, we'll talk a lot about week one here in a few minutes. But what I really wanted to talk about, Mitch, I wanted to talk about some traditions and some of the yeah. fun team stories that we got. We asked coaches around the area when they submitted their high school football preview forms about something that we need to know about your program. Maybe a little something different than the X's and O's or the personality, you know, or as John Schlemmer used to say, the X's and O's and the Jimmy's and the Joe's, you know, we, we want to know a little more than, you know, than just that. So let's get into it. We got some fun responses. We'll kind of go through the list here. We'll start in the Lincoln land. How about you want to know mine? You want to know mine first? Yes. Let's hear it. Okay. So this, okay. Hang, okay. So this is not a Morrison tradition, but okay. um, my senior year, we did this before every single um, home game, certainly. And then if, I guess I don't remember if any away games had like a delayed departure time. Probably not. But anyway, for every home game. So one of our one of our uh, teammates lived like across the street from the field. Um, so much to where you could like see the JV game going on or or just whatever. You could see the field. So every home game, we would go to, to his house after school, right after school. Um, usually like one parent or his parent, it was probably his parent most of the time, uh, would prepare a pregame meal. And we would watch Friday Night Lights every single home game. So 
Um, again, I don't know what, what Morrison does now, but I hope every team has, you know, has gone on to do their own thing, but that was what we would do. We would have a pregame meal together and we would watch Friday night lights, the movie, not the show, the movie. Yeah. I love that. I think you've told me that story before, but that's great. And I'm guessing that it's one of those houses that I see like the tailgating when I'm going to and from games on a Friday night. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, let's get into some of those traditions and some of the things we read about. Anawan Weathersfield, this one, we'll start out. This one might be one of my favorites. Yeah. Every, yeah. Head coach, head coach Tony Grip says every Wednesday night they have a weight room theme. So like jorts, swim trunks, stars and stripes, et cetera. That's a fun one. But what I really love is every summer they would go to what they called the Sand Hill outside of Mineral, Illinois. So small town outside of Anawan. And they would run up this hill and use it for team bonding, mental, physical toughness experience. You know what it reminds me of? You've seen the old video and the uh, the poster of Walter Payton, who always ran that hill, that dirt hill in his warmups. That's what it reminds me of. Like, I, I, I picture the sand hill and mineral, you know, small town football, and these kids are working this hill. I love that story. Right. Yeah. Um... Yeah, two uh, two really good uh, traditions there right off the bat. Um, but then they've even got a third, right? So they they talk about having a dad's decal night where um, after the first Thursday team meal before their Friday week one game. So, so we're this right will be upon coming that. Up here in a couple of days, yep. Right here in a couple of days, where uh, uh, the the players, the parents, the guardians. Um, I guess I'll, let me rephrase that. The parents and the guardians will help the players. Uh, put on their decals onto the helmet. So that's that's a really cool uh, family event right before uh, game time. Yeah, that's a great one. I love that one too. We've heard a couple of those and that that's really cool. Well, Mitch, let's keep moving along. Rova Williams Field. Did you hear about this? I saw this on Facebook this week. Rova Williams Field has a new fight song, a new school fight song. I think it's combined for the co-op for Rova and Williams Field. They're combining for a new fight song that will be played as the team runs out onto the field. They do a great kind of team entrance. They run through a huge banner. They have smoke going off. It's a really cool experience and they have the band playing and it's going to be playing a new fight song this year. It's awesome. Yeah. You love, you love that. Um, You know, always cool to to start new traditions, right? So uh, especially for a co-op program like Robo Williams field, um, you know, how do you balance that, the, the old traditions of, you know, the schools involved while you create a new one with a new identity. So yeah, love that. Yeah. And the other, they always have had, since they've been Rova Williams field, they've always had a really good, nice looking midfield logo. I didn't realize until head coach Grant Goldstrand in pointed out to me that it's actually the Williams field superintendent drives to Rova and draws it up and paints it himself. Wow. Is it, is it RW or what is it? Yep. Yep. It's the RW, the same one they have on their helmet. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's great. Y- you gotta love the superintendent doing the quote unquote other duties as assigned, right? I love it. Like, right. You know, in in some schools it could be in thinking about painting the lines. You know, maybe. Yeah. Um, it could be the the school janitors. You know, it's so yeah, like you said, it's always cool to see uh, the familiar faces that you've seen around school getting involved with the football program. So yeah, love love that. Yep. Yep. Let's move into Elmwood Brimfield. This year marks the 16th year they've done what they call the blackout for Easter Seals. So Elmwood Brimfield has raised over $80,000 in that 16-year period with over $300,000 raised across central Illinois. So he said uh, head coach uh, there, I believe, is Hollis. Coach Hollis says that it's a legacy that their program is incredibly proud of. So that's that's a really cool story out there. Yeah, a lot of money there. Good good for them. Next on our list, the McComb Bombers. Their head coach reached out to us and let us know that their high school players coach flag football on Saturday mornings. So this was something they started a couple years ago. And he said it's really sparked interest in football with the younger kids. And he says it's fun because with the high school players kind of coaching against themselves, that there becomes some complete competitive, you know, rivalry with play calling sure. And, you know, a little bit of friendly trash talk after games. But he says it's also really cool to see the younger kids looking up to those high school athletes. That's a cool experience all the way around. Yeah, you love to see that, that sort of involvement to, like like they said, to to continue that that youth engagement. 
Um, and that I've never, I've maybe other programs do that. I've never heard of, of coaching flag football or even playing flag football on, on Saturday mornings. Um, certainly the Macomb community might do it a little differently, but uh, yeah, I, that's, that's great. Very cool. Yep. Yep. That's a cool one. Mitch, how about in Fulton family feud night? Do you want to go to family feud night in Fulton? So only if the pizza is provided from Manny's. Oh, there you go. There you go. So it's yes, we'll get right from, into it. It's probably from Riverbend Pizza, be my guess. But okay, if for anyone who's listening, you can get it in Fulton and Savannah. I think are the only two. Yeah, especially uh, Manny's Manny's Pizza. Get it. Thank oh, you later, Mitch. Let me tell you a great story. So they have the um, I think they still have it. The Manny's the Manny's Shootout. It's a basketball um, all day shootout in the right around okay. Christmas time. And okay. one year it was a big, the big marquee matchup was Rock Ridge versus Newman last game of the night. So it started at like eight o'clock. So I stayed shot video, didn't have time to obviously drive back from Savannah from West Carroll. So I just edited there, edited in the cafeteria, sent it back. So by the time I'm done, the game's over, everything's done. They're closing up shop. Mitch, obviously it's, it's, sponsored by Manny's they had Manny's pizza there they had like a box full of pizza left and I'm leaving and the guy's like do you want to take some with you and I was like absolutely I do so man on the way back I'm just indulging in Manny's pizza it was a delicious ride home I will say that see see next time next time we're in Fulton we gotta we gotta speak to our friend of the show and AD there at Fulton Jeff Parsons to uh to take us out to Manny's I think we should line that up yeah, I believe he's going to be the new Fulton principal. So even, you know. Is it principal? Okay, I thought it was AD. Okay. He was. I think he was AD. Oh, now he's moving into the principal yeah, okay. role. So, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Either, way, uh, either way, Manny's is still the <laughs> the goal. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right, there you go. So, yes, we, we got sidetracked. We got way sidetracked. Yeah. But family <laughs> feud night. So, it would have been this past Saturday. The team and the families gathered for a pizza party. After the pizza, they divide up into teams and they play family feud. So that's that's awesome. That's a ton of fun. And their other kind of more on field or more more team related tradition. I did not realize that they put the steamboats on the helmets that which they've had the logo on there for several years, which is a great look. But that strength coach Jared Wessels also gives out the anchor stickers, which go on the back. Mitch, I did mm-hmm. not realize that a football player at Fulton has to earn their anchor. So that's the phrase, the quote they use, earn your anchor for off season, for off season lifting. So that's a cool, that's a cool moment, you know, to have to like kind of earn your, literally earn your stripes as you you might say. Yeah. I've, I've been around Fulton for a long time and I don't think I ever realized that. So yeah, that's a, that's a great tradition. Yeah. That's a really cool one. So uh, moving down the way in the Northwest upstate Illini, um, it would have been this past couple weekends, Forreston. They do a couple different traditions. The one really cool one, I knew they had a midnight practice. So as soon as you can start practicing at midnight on that day, they get up and going. Well, on that first midnight practice, they have a full practice that starts at midnight. After a brief session, the team meets, they eat together. The senior dads or father figures of each player, they share a final message to their seniors. And then they get started with their season. Um, Coach Janicki said, this is a great tradition that started before me and one that I participated in when I was in school. And he says he still does it now as a head coach and has his dad there who does stats for the team and also grills food for that night. So that's that's really cool kind of team bonding. And it's obviously a unique situation where it's the midnight practice, but to have the dads in there on that first one is a, is a really cool one. And on the flip side, then they do a lunch the following week dedicated to the moms or the mother figures in each player's family. So they serve them food. The senior players share a letter of appreciation to their mom. So really cool. And then the moms help put on the helmet decals. So again, with the helmet decal kind of tradition, that's a really cool one. Yeah, I I love love both of those. So if uh, not playing favorites, but that... (laughs) That's a special, that's a special, you know, uh, I guess it's in, in, in a one week stretch, two separate events in one week um, that uh, a real special time for, for, for players and parents and guardians. So yeah, love that coming from Forreston. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Dupec, the Rivermen, Mitch, this is one we've seen 
you know, yep. as the co-op has formed and really become a team that's, you know, kind of on our radar all the time, they walk out. I've seen the photos and it looks amazing. They walk out every yep. game with flags representing the different branches of the military. So it's something they started a few years ago. And he said that veterans from obviously from their home crowd have recognized it, but even veterans and people from the away games have stopped them and thanked them for doing that. You've seen the pictures. It's a really powerful image. There's, it's a lot of big yeah. flags. And they're all hauling them out. Yeah, it sure is. And they've done, uh, they've in the past, they've done military appreciation uh, uniforms too, haven't they? I believe, yeah, they may have. And I know Galva's done it a couple times. Um, yeah. There's been a couple other teams that have done it. It's it's That's a cool, really cool look yep. as well. Yep, really cool tradition. Yeah. Let's talk about Eastland Pearl City. Have you been to a game at Eastland Pearl City, Mitch, with the, uh, with the diesel trucks? I have. Yes. Yeah. So that's so tell tell us about it. That's a cool one. Yeah. So they they call it coming down the hill um, for for their games, and they've got these these big diesel trucks that start and and they blow smoke as as the team comes down the hill. So um, it, it's loud, right? Um, there, there's a lot going on, a lot of excitement. So um, yeah, it, it's a really cool scene if you've never seen it. Um, they also do like force and they also have a midnight practice during the first week of practice. Um, uh, again, on that, on that first very day that they can, they can practice they're they're rep, up and ready to go at midnight. So, um, it would be like, the, the, you know, Friday and then going into Saturday. So, um, yeah, I, I, I didn't know that, uh, teams did that and certainly not more than one. So yeah, this is, uh, I like the midnight practice. That's a cool, uh, a cool thing. I would love to see that. Yeah, I had heard of it, but I wasn't exactly sure who did it. So that's, yeah, I was glad to get these notes, um, you know, to talk about some of these teams. Right. Um, couple, like your, um, like Eastland Pearl City, a couple other teams that kind of, you know, walk down a hill or come down for a cool, like, visual entrance. Mendota started doing that. Head coach Keegan Hill mentioned they walk down the hill. That's a growing tradition for the Trojans uh, in Mendota. Also, Mercer County has walked down the big hill at George Pratt Memorial Field for years, going back to when they were the Green Dragons of Alito. So that always is a cool atmosphere to watch a football game. And talking about entrances, the Western Big Six, Sterling does it really well. Sterling has the band playing, the cheerleaders form a tunnel. The fans are right kind of on top of the track there there where they run out that's a great experience. I love watching that one. Rock Island has a very similar type of entrance at Rocky stadium. That one's really cool. Um, so yeah, those are good ones. If there's anybody I left out, I apologize. You know, these are just the ones that were included in the notes or, you know, that, um, that we, that we know about, but if, if you have something, let us know, we'd love to talk about it. That's the kind of stuff that, you know, that extra stuff that makes it fun. Two more. I wanted to mention there's two victory bells that I know of. Maybe there's more, but there's two that I definitely know of. Geneseo has always had a victory bell sitting in the corner of the end zone. And Milledgeville has a victory bell that sits up on the top of their hill. I've been at both places when they've won a game and they ring that bell. That's very yep. cool too. Yeah. Both, uh, both enormous bells. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. Both, uh, both terrific. Certainly, Milledgeville not a tradition, but you know, they, they like to they like to have these big displays, right? They got the they got the missile out front. They got the bell on the field. So, oh yeah, um, yeah, love that they they play into that. Let me see this, Greg, because I don't know how many teams do it, but I would love to know if any of our teams have like turnover chains, because I would like to tell them to stop that because Uh-oh. that is annoying. Uh-oh. And it it overplayed, and it was cool, kind of cool when Miami did it. And now everyone's got like different things and it's just, okay, we get it. No big deal. So again, if anyone does it, let me know, but I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to ask you to please now find something to now, do. Now, Mitch, I will say that last year, Princeton had a turnover change. I remember you brought it up on the pod. So. And I probably, I probably gave it praise. And now that I'm getting old, I just, <laughs> come on. Just, in one, <laughs> in one season, you've gotten old. Look at that. I know it's terrible. I, again, maybe I, maybe I was, uh, maybe I wasn't too thrilled with it either. Um, but you know, it's just tired at this point. So. Oh, let's, all right. Well, note, note. To, it's probably because I, it's probably because I threw so many interceptions back in my day that I just don't <laughs> care uh, to celebrate turnovers. So maybe that's it. That's fair. That is. The, it's, it's subconsciously just eating at me. That is the quarterback in you. Yeah, definitely yeah. coming out there. 
Well, Mitch, before we jump into week one, we're going to break down all the matchups. We're going to talk about what games most intrigue us. Let's thank our sponsors. We start with Brink Sportswear. They offer totally custom made-to-order football uniforms that allow coaches and athletic directors to take control of their brands. The uniforms are available in sublimated and tackle twill. They offer free digital mock-ups, free shipping on team orders, and physical samples before you buy so you know exactly what you're getting before you spend a dime of your program's money. Uniform sets start at $99 for sublimated and $120 for tackle twill. Find them on Twitter or go to brinksportswear.com. The second, our other sponsor we want to thank, looking for the perfect gift for your high school football player, check out Matthewson's Mini Helmets. They offer totally custom mini helmets or decals for your school. Find them on Facebook or on Twitter. They are. We are also thrilled to introduce the Matthewson's Mini Helmets Player of the Week Award. We've talked about it, you know, in the last couple of preview episodes. We are really excited this year. Each week, we'll be awarding the best performance from our area with a custom View from the West Mini Helmet to include your the athlete's name and school. It's going to be great. So excited for that. Again, that's Matthewson's Mini Helmets on Facebook and on Twitter. So Mitch, here we are. Let's jump into the games in week one. Mitch, I give you credit. I got to thank you. You looked through and did the research for a lot of the non-conference games we got here. We start in the Western Big Six where they're still in, they're going to be a non-conference play here for a couple weeks. We start with United Township and LaSalle, Peru. This one will be in East Moline. United Township has the home game against the LaSalle, Peru Cavaliers Interstate 8 Conference. Cavaliers won the week one matchup last year, 31-21. So Mitch, what do you see as you look into this matchup? Well, it's it's a revenge game, right, for, for UT uh, to get off on the right foot. Certainly, uh, the Soul Bowl is a tough place to play. So I'm looking to see if Matthew Kelly can lead that Panther offense again to score points at the rate that they did last year. Um, and, and I really want to see that 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 defense clamp up in crunch time, right? Uh, Coach Walsh is, is, thinks his, his defense will be much improved than it was last year. Um, so looking to see how how they respond from from a tough year last year, both on both sides of the ball. UT has a lot of guys coming back, a lot of skilled guys that have been around for a couple of years now. Kelly himself. Um, so again, looking to see if the Panthers can can get a little revenge here on the Cavaliers and start their season on the right foot. Yeah, I'm excited to see Corey Randall. You know, he's been a playmaker that I, it's been fun to watch. I'm excited to see him get going this season. And yeah, I think, Mitch, when we've looked around the schedule, I think there's there's ways for United Township to be a playoff team this year. But this is an important mm-hmm. one, you know, to start off on the right foot, obviously, you know, to get the win in week one, to build that momentum. But I think in the long run, when you look at their schedule, this is one of those games that if, if you want to be a playoff team, this would go a long way in getting you there and getting this win. So this is, yeah, I think this is a big, a big game in week one for United Township. Nice to be at home for that one to get that start. Yep. Yep. Well, let's, let's talk about Galesburg and Dunlap. Dunlap from the mid Illini Conference. Mitch, this is an Eagles team that was five and five last year but they're always kind of a program that's in the mix. They've had a lot of really good seasons. We've seen them, you know, kind of cross over and play some of our teams in the Western Big Six. They've played Galesburg a couple times. I think they've played Rock Island in years past. This Dunlap team is predicted by Peoria Journal Star to be the top team in their conference. So they, you know, they could be a lot to handle for a Galesburg team, you know, in week one here. Yeah, t- t- tough matchup here, uh, but a good opportunity for Galesburg. Uh, Gina Williams to, to find their identity in, in week one. No coach was was saying they'll, they'll have some, uh, you know, I should say a mix of, of returning experience plus new starters. So, um, yeah, looking looking forward to seeing, again, that that that, that Gina Williams offense. Um, and he's going to be matched by a good quarterback on the on the Dunlap side, too. I believe he's a sophomore, Max, Max Sutter. Um so yeah, we could we could see some really good skill players in this game. So uh, the Middle Atlantic Conference always really good. Dunlap usually a playoff team, as you mentioned, and uh, they, they've got high hopes this year. So we'll see if Galesburg can uh, uh, can upset this Dunlap team here in a couple of days. Yep, that's a game we'll be watching for sure. Let's move along. Geneseo will take on Chicago Noble. The Catamounts went six and three a year ago in the Chicago Public League. 
the the Maple Leafs played um, them last year and they won big 52 to six. They also won 49 to nothing the season before. So I feel like kind of based on what we know about Geneseo, this seems like a game the Maple Leafs should win. Obviously, you got to show up and get the job done. But I think with the amount of returning talent, if they come out focused, then they should get off to a hot start. And I would think blow this one open, you know, fairly early by halftime. Yeah, I, I think they were up 27 nothing within the first couple minutes of the game last year. Yeah. Um, starting on the starting on the first kickoff, I, I think Chicago Noble fumbled and, and Genesio went on to to score pretty quickly. But I mean, you know, uh, Genesio was a team that we talked about as a dark horse for Western Big Six. I'm looking at A.J. Weller, uh, a three-year starter, uh, Jerron Neal, Luke Johnson, you know, um, plenty of guys that play on the line and on defense as well coming back for this Geneseo team. So I have high hopes for Geneseo this year. I think I said that I thought they were going to get to six wins. This will be one of them. And uh, just excited to see what the, the team really looks like this year. Mitch, maybe one of the most fun matchups that we get in the Western Big Six non-conference, Quincy versus Quincy Notre Dame. I mean, yeah. this is a game I want to go to someday because it's just that in-town rivalry. I love it. That That's going to be a great atmosphere. Yeah, we'll have to get the lowdown from Shuck on this, this one. But, um, you know, anything can happen in a rivalry game, right? Throw the records out, even if both teams are 0-0, zero, zero, and zero, throw them out, right? But um, in the end, I, I think Brain Little, Jareus Rice, and then that just <laughs> quadrant of, of receivers, Hammers, uh, Johansson, Metmeyer, Byquist. It's just going to be too much. I, I we're, we've we've talked a lot about Quincy this year and what we expect them to be like. So even in a rivalry game, it's going to be a lot of fun for a Week One matchup. Um, and and I, I think we'll probably be seeing Quincy Notre Dame in the playoffs in two way this year. So not going to be the last time we talk about Quincy Notre Dame, but for this Week One, uh, I'm looking to, for Quincy to put up some points. Yeah, I think you never know in a rivalry matchup. You know what can happen. You know that. That emotions are high. It's week one. You know, it's it's just kind of an odd feel to it just because you're still kind of getting, you know, getting used to everything. But I do feel well, like, yeah, this Quincy squad is ready to go. Well, and that's the thing too, right? Quincy, I think, is is fully aware of their expectations. They probably put it on themselves as well, and that's that's warranted. So can they play up to those expectations, right? Don't let the moment be too big for you. Don't, you know, um, get too high on your horse before you've even played a game. So, you know, again, in a rivalry game, this could be something where Quincy Notre Dame has an opening. So it'll be up to Quincy to shut that door and uh, and to get out of there with a win. Yep. A couple other matchups here. A um, couple other good matchups. Rock Island, yeah. Rock Island at Manuka, the Southwest Prairie Conference, the west side of the conference. Manuka Indians, seven and four a year ago. They've been a playoff team for five straight seasons. Their wide receiver, Donovan Anderson, has FCS offers. They also have a Ball State commit in Brady Barrowman. He's a 6'6 offensive tackle. This Manuka program is, is solid year in and year out. Um, for uh, Coach Fritz and the Rocks, this is a tough test in week one. Yeah, this is, this is a, a good Manuka team with a lot of good athletes. They have a really good running game um, with, with guys coming back. So, yeah, first game for Coach Fritz. Um, again, he talked about how quickly can their players get comfortable in that new offense and defensive scheme. Because again, this, this Rock Island team could look a lot different than what we, we've been used to the past couple of years. So they're really going to have to be ready here to face a good Manuka team. Um, but you know, can, can Javion Clark Pugh, Joe Allen, a guy that we've talked about before, um, can the rocks be ready to go and can they get a win against Manuka here, which that game is. Is that game at Manuka? Okay. Yep. So yep. yeah. Can you get a, can you get a week one win on the road? I think that would play big for their season outlook. Yeah, that would certainly, yeah. For Rock Island to get a road win in week one against a quality program, that would be a, yeah, that would be a marquee win for them, you know, moving down the way. How about Sterling at Metamora? This one's kind of fun. Head coach John Schlemmer going back home. He, he was born and raised in Metamora, went to high school there. So the Metamora Redbirds from the Middle Illini Conference, they were seven and four a year ago. I think it goes without saying, Metamora is a, you know, historic program, right? I mean, they're, they're one of the upper echelon programs year in and year out that they're, they're playing at a high level names to watch this year for this Metamora team quarterback, Nick Rhodes, running back, Mark Frederick. So, you know, it's a new look Sterling offense. 
I guess I'm curious to see kind of, you know, where, oh, like a lot of teams, like a lot of teams like Sterling, curious to see kind of how they get going, how they, how they set the tone in week one. Right. You know, we're, we're assuming that Kale uh, Lettergerber is, is going to be that starting quarterback. They had a kind of a position battle for that all summer, but we, we do believe he will be the starter. So how, how does he fill in that role uh, that was, that was filled by, um, you know, JP Schilling and, and, and Kale Ryan, AJ Kested, Antonio Tablante. So this will look like a whole new Sterling team, but it certainly has familiar faces. Lucas Austin going to be anchoring that line at six, seven, Andre Clay, um, who was injured all last year. They're really excited about what he brings to the table. So uh, we, we expect Sterling to be competing once again for the Western big six. And so I, I really want to see what this team looks like here in week one um, against a really good Metamora team, like you mentioned. Last but certainly not least, let's cover the defending Western Big Six champions, the Moline Maroons. They go on the road to Glenbard North. So the Panthers last year were four and five. They come out of the Duquesne Conference. Mitch, that's a tough conference. You're talking about teams like Batavia, St. Charles, Wheaton Schools. You know, that's that's one that I see, uh, you know, Coach Big Pete talking about every week is the Duquesne Conference. So they got some big time football there. So I think for week one, Moline's given themselves a good test here. Yeah, well, big time football in the Western Big Six too, right? So um, this Moline team certainly has been battle tested over the years that they've had the success to back it up. Um, you know, we're going to see some new faces here, right? So they're going to have to continue to build that depth through their experience. They got a lot of guys to replace some, some familiar names, right? Like Pablo Perez is going to be running the ball. We certainly talked about him a lot last year, but I think what, what coach Morrissey is excited about um, is how good they're going to be on the line and really defensively, certainly in their front seven. So if you win those battles, you're going to win a lot of games. So looking forward to seeing what Moline looks like, but I do think because Glenn Bard North comes in with a little bit of a lack experience, even though Moline somewhat suffers from that too, I think in the end, because they can win uh, the battle of the trenches, I think Moline will walk away with a win in this one. Yep. So Mitch, what game kind of stands out to you then? If you're looking at all these Western big six games, I think I know where you're going and I'm probably going the same yeah. way. I, th I think, I think Sterling at Metamora just based on the two teams uh, previous experience and what they want to be this year. I think they can both set a tone here. Strong has a really tough start to their season. Um, they, they certainly need the win here to get off on the right foot. But, um, yeah, I think that's what just intrigues me the most. Certainly, I, I think UT and, and LaSalle Peru will be a good game. Um, at Quincy and Quincy Nordale will be a great game. But I think just in terms of what implications are, I think for Sterling to get a win will will push them miles ahead right early on in the season, whereas a loss just kind of sets them back just a little bit, not in the Western Big Six, but just from a season outlook standpoint. Yeah, I, I really, like I mentioned, I really love the Quincy versus Quincy Notre Dame matchup in week one. I love that crosstown rivalry. But I think for kind of the competitive game, what I think is going to be the best game I really look at this Sterling Metamora game. I think it's two great programs that come in really wanting to set the tone. I, that's the game I look at as well. So, all right, well, Mitch, let's move into the Three Rivers Athletic Conference. We'll start Kiwani at Sherrard. This is a game that I circled several weeks ago that I think is really yeah. intriguing to me. You got a Boilermakers team that brings a lot of kids back. They're pretty excited about what they got. But you also have this Sherrard team that despite being one and eight a year ago, you know, there's a lot of momentum there. There's, there's some quiet confidence building in that Sherrard program as well. Yeah, you, you said it best. They, they've certainly been building up to that. Um, you know, and I, I, I look at guys um, just looking at their, looking at their roster, right. They, they bring out a lot of guys who were first team all conference, second team all conference, Ombro mention um, guys that were, were, were sophomores or underclassmen last year. So looking really looking forward to seeing what Sherrard has. And then looking at, at Kiwani, guys that we've talked about before, Brady Clark, Alex Duarte, Corbin Powers. So this is a team that also brings back a lot of experience, some accolades. So um, we talked about just a minute ago with, with Sterling. Now we're talking more, uh, again, another game that has implications on the season, but this also has uh, implications with conference play. So 
Um, you, you were right to have circled this game a while ago because I think, again, um, the, the, whoever wins this game has the leg up in getting that playoff spot. These are two teams that are certainly capable of getting to five wins this year. So really it'll be can that, can that Boilermakers experience get them over the edge or will Sherrard's younger players continue to impress like they did last year? Yep, yep. Well, two teams looking to impress and kind of flip the script from a year ago. Bureau Valley at Erie Prophetstown. Two teams that, you know, they want to take that next step. They want to kind of forget about last year. Erie Prophetstown, will they have their identity ready to go in week one? Can Bureau Valley's returning starters get revenge from last year's 33 to nothing loss? So, you know, I think that, you know, last year Bureau Valley struggled. Um, so right away in week one, can they take advantage of an Erie Prophetstown team still trying to find themselves or will it be Erie Prophetstown that's ready to roll? I think this is, an, you know, another one that, you know, is intriguing. Yes, yeah, so I think that's the word for it. You've got a new coach there, Tyler White, Brett at EP. What kind of system is he implementing uh, versus a Bureau Valley team that, frankly, I'm excited about. You know, a lot of returning guys who who played last year as, as freshmen, as sophomores, um, you know, Bryce Helms. Um, and I think you, you talked up Blake Foster, who's a freshman coming in. So uh, I'm intrigued by, by Bureau Valley this season and intrigued by this game too, because I want to see how EP comes out. Um, and again, like you said, which team can, can kind of start to flip their script, get the ball rolling a little bit better, um, and then start 2023 off the right way. Yeah. You know, coach Whitebread has been, you know, in the system, he was an assistant coach yep. going throughout the year. So I don't know if they've changed very much. But either way, you're right with, you know, with they lost a lot of production from a year ago. So with, you know, with him being now in charge, are they, you know, are they ready to go in week one? I think that'll be something to follow. But I'm guessing a lot of the system is probably similar to what they've had. So, sure. um, you know, I think it really comes down to, you know, Bureau Valley and their, and their returning experience that Coach Pistol is excited about. If they're, you know, ready to go from the opening kick, you know, that that's that's a good one to watch. Let's move down the list. Yep. Mendota at Morrison. Mitch, I know this was a game that you've talked about being excited about. Yeah, so Morrison certainly coming off of a playoff team, or sorry, a playoff season last year with a lot of underclassmen. Now you've got a new coach, um, and, and you bring a lot of those players back, a lot of fast players. Mendota was a playoff team two years ago. So this, you know, to have these two programs squaring off this early in the season um is big big for the conference big for playoffs so i think the key to me here greg is, is that mendota defense right a, a unit that gave up 352 points last year can the mustangs utilize that speed can they score quickly on that off or on that defense and even on the flip side can their speed on the defense slow down a mendota offense that has put points up certainly they put up a lot of points last year so could it could be a, a slugfest could be a shootout a lot of intrigue in this game here. Looking forward to seeing, again, how these teams look here in week one. Mitch, I think the word of the week in the three rivers is intrigue. There is a lot of intrigue. Yeah. In a, but I think, yeah, I think I'm think i making the joke, but I think that it's because these games are conference matchups. You know, they're, some of them are crossovers, but they're still conference games in general. They're all three rivers teams. So that, that is, they are intriguing matchups. Well, and that, and that, yeah, that's, that, that's just how every week one is, right? Because we don't, we don't know what these teams look like just yet. Yep. We have an idea and, and we know what teams, what teams bring back, but every, every season's different. You could bring back your starting 11 and you won't have the same results as you did last year. So yeah, if, if we overuse the word intrigue, um, you know, that's, that's on us to not be up on our Webster's, but you know, it, it's just the truth because it, it will take a few weeks for some of these teams um, to, to get that identity and for us to really understand what their strengths are um, more than others. So yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Well, and I think in the exciting part of the season, like we referenced at the beginning of the show is this early part of the season is the chance for a lot of teams to kind of prove themselves or to show what they are. And some of those stories that come out of nowhere that we're not expecting, that's kind of the fun of all of it is, is kind of following these seasons that we say, Whoa, you know, we didn't see that coming or here, you know, look at what they're doing. So that's that's what's right. exciting about this time of year. Princeton at Monmouth Roseville. Mitch, we've talked a lot about Princeton. We think they're one of the favorites to win their side of the, the conference once again. Last year, they beat Monmouth Roseville 48 to nothing. Monmouth Roseville looks different this year, but so does Princeton. So 
you know, I think we're excited about what Princeton has, but it is it is week one. So can can Monmouth Roseville do something to slow down this Princeton team? Yeah, you'll you'll have to win win in the trenches to beat a team like Princeton, who I think, at least with with Kyle at NUIC football's rankings, will come in as the top team in three A. So to, to beat a team like that, to beat a strong team like Princeton, you'll have to win the trenches. And that's something that Coach Adolfson said that he wants to see. Um, and certainly I think most coaches would echo that if you can control the line, chances are you might have a, a chance at controlling the game. So what can they do to slow down Princeton? Like you mentioned, it, it was it was not very close last season at all. But this is a different Princeton team, also a different Monmouth Roseville team. So um, we'll see what happens. And at Monmouth Roseville, again, opening up on the road is never easy. So we'll see what happens on Friday night. Yep. Uh, another game in the Three Rivers Athletic Conference that I think is really important for both teams, Hall at Orion. Hall was a five-win playoff team a year ago. Orion fell a game short of the playoffs at four and five. Based on what I see in the rest of their schedules, I think this win would go a long way in determining if one of these teams is a playoff team. You know, we talked about it in the preview. What does Hall look like in the post Mac Resetic world? Um, a guy who was 90% of their offense production, and I couldn't even begin to tell you how many tackles that he had. So th this Hall team will look completely different. Um, and, and for Orion, a young team, but bringing back a lot of skilled players, can that offense, can that Charger offense have those explosive plays that, that coach uh, is looking for? Um, I, I think they can. Um, and uh, like you said, this game, I think when you, when we when we fast forward to week nine and, and, or sorry, let's say, let's say week nine before week nine game start. And we look at maybe both teams are, are sitting, you know, with needing a win in week nine, right? You don't always want to be in that situation needing to win that final game of the regular season to get into the playoffs. So then that's when you look back and think, Oh, if I could have done this in week one or could have done this in week two, um, this is one of those games that you, you want to walk out of that game with a, with a win because you don't want to look back thinking, what if, yeah, I think for Hall, the, the biggest thing is, is, you know, uh, Randy, head coach Randy Timon talked about them needing to, you know, mature quickly because they, the, the kids they do return are still pretty young and they've gotten some minutes at the varsity level, but there's, there's a lot of turnover. So I think how, how game ready, how varsity ready are they in week one? And on the flip side, can Orion kind of take advantage of that? because they have Kale Filler back at quarterback. They have, um, I believe, Edmonds at a running back position. They have several wide receivers that Coach is excited about, and Coach Filler likes their defense as well. So I think looking at this Oregon squad, if they're ready to jump in right away in week one, especially being that they're at home, I think if that, that will go a long way in this matchup against a Hall team that may still be trying to figure out, you know, kind of where all their pieces fit. Still, still the best uniforms in the track, too. They did. Yes, I thought about that the other day. Yeah, they we've never revisited that yet. And it might be time because we've had some uniform turnover. Yeah, have we, though? Have we? Maybe not. A, you're right. Maybe not a lot. But, you, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, Orion would still be in the mix. The, yeah, the I think Chrome, some teams the, uh, the Chrome Oregon O for the Orion Chargers, yeah. I think I love that. I've, I've always been a fan of that. It's a good look. Good, good. Not, if anything else, a really good set of helmets in the track. Uh, everyone kind of brings their A game in the helmet game. There you go. There you go. And that that is, you that's know, important. very important. That's really important. Yes, exactly. All right, Mitch, Newman at Rock Ridge. Rock Ridge won the game last year 33-8. to eight. I, I believe it was close. I was there, and I believe it was close at halftime, and then Rock Ridge broke it open in the second half. So I think looking ahead to this year, we the questions we've had about Newman last year were the offense. They weren't putting up as many points as we thought maybe they, you know, that they had in years past. Can the offense develop a little more consistency in the second year under head coach Mike LeMay? On the Rockridge side of things, we've talked a lot about the players they have to replace. But Mitch, every time we talk about Rock Ridge, there's so many names that we've called from last year. Zarla Tanis and Connor Deem. And on the defensive side of the ball, you have, you know, Landon Bull is in the center of things. So I think there's just a lot of talent for Rockridge. What do you see in this matchup? 
Yeah, I, I see. I see a Rock Ridge team that is is probably going to have one of the better offensive lines in the conference. Um, and we've we've talked a lot about in the in the game previews here about winning that winning that battle. So um, can, can Newman again with with Coach Lemay as a defensive minded coach? What what can he bring to the table to slow down this Rocket offense? Because even though there's a lot of new names. Um, well, let me rephrase that. There's a lot of names that we we were used to calling last season that are no longer there. But the Rockets bring back a lot of names like like you mentioned, Zarlatanis, Freyermuth, uh, Muller, Connor Deem. Um, you know, there's probably ten guys who can who can touch the ball for the Rockets at any given time. So, what what can Coach Lemay do to slow this Rockridge team down? Uh, again, a team that I said on the preview podcast that I expect to go eight and one, nine and zero oh maybe. So. Um, th- this will be a great game, though. It's always a great game between these two these two schools. It'll be important for Rock Ridge to get off on the right foot because they've got a really tough matchup in Week Two against uh, Ridgeview, Lexington, Colfax. But for Newman as well, kind of like you mentioned, can they find that consistency on offense? We know that they'll be pretty pretty good on defense, but can they find that consistency on offense that'll keep them in games against teams like Rock Ridge? Yeah, Mitch, we have had one update, so we have heard a quarterback update from Rock Ridge. It will be okay. Colin Schweigen, who will be the quarterback, freshman quarterback. So similar to kind of what we saw at Orion with Kale Filler last year, coming in as a freshman, taking over the offense. It's interesting yep. to see, you know, how he can build his confidence. You know, as a freshman, he's got talented pieces around him, but, you know, it's probably going to take some time to get comfortable out there. So I think a Rock Ridge, a quick Rock Ridge start would go a long way to building his confidence. So it'll be interesting to watch that. And also with him being a quarterback, you're moving Connor Deem out, right? Either to a slot receiver, a running back type position. That's just a a Swiss army knife to have somewhere in your offense. He's going to do a lot and he'll he'll do a lot for you on defense too. His athleticism will translate over the defensive side, which we've seen. So, all right, one more game to cover Riverdale versus Dupo on Saturday. So the Riverdale Rams back on the field at the varsity level. So that in itself is great to see that coach Derricks has a team fielded. They're going to be out on the field on Saturday of week one. They play Dupo, the Tigers out of the Cahokia conference. They were a playoff team last year. Yeah. It'll it'll be great to see the the Rams on the field again, after, after taking a a year to kind of reset. So uh, regardless of what happens and not making any sort of prediction, when I say that I'm just, it's, No matter what happens, it's good to see Riverdale and that program back on the field this year. Yep, absolutely. Before we move into the Lincoln Land Conference, let's thank our sponsor, the Cupcake Cartel. Gourmet cupcakes that are made to order. Over 40 flavors, including wedding cake, lemon blueberry, strawberry milkshake, snickerdoodle, Oreo. Perfect for weddings, birthdays, fundraisers, showers, whatever you need. You can find the Cupcake Cartel on Facebook. We want to thank them for their support. The Quad City's first and only fantasy football show, For Fantasy Sake, has you all covered when it comes to all of your fantasy football needs. The guys come to you live every Sunday morning during the football season from 10 to 1130. They've got the best analysis, rankings, DFS, and gambling advice between The Rock and Mississippi Rivers. So tune in to For Fantasy Sake every Sunday during the football season from 10 to 1130 a.m. on Facebook and YouTube. Let's move into the Lincoln Land Conference. We'll start with Mercer County at United. This is a Mercer County team that, you know, we feel pretty highly on on their side of the division. So they cross over technically with United. They they used to be Lincoln Trail rivals. Now they're in separate sides of the Lincoln Land as the divisions divide up. Yeah, this this is always a traditional fun game uh, to watch. We, We... You know, looking at Mercer County, this will be their their last year uh, in this new uh, conference before they move to the track. But this this will be a good team. This will be a multi dimensional team. We've talked a lot about Colton uh, Colby Cox coming back as, as the quarterback for the for this Golden Eagle team. So, um, yeah, I, I have high expectations uh, for Mercer County this year, and, and for United. You know, Coach Miller always has has a team ready to play. So. Um, that they do have some talented pieces coming back. Um, so again, a really great rivalry game uh, to kick off your week one in the uh, the newly formed LLC. Yep. 
Moving down the way, uh, staying on Mercer County's side of things, on the bigger end of the Lincoln land, you have Illini West versus Farmington. So two of the teams are kind of newer to our, you know, podcast listening area. But this one could go a long way in deciding who's a playoff team. Farmington has had a consistent, good program. Illini West is trying to get back up, you know, kind of climb their way back up. Um, This one would be an interesting uh, week one matchup for sure. Yeah, Farmington, uh, a seven and two team last year, but a lot to replace. That they they could be playing as many as ten underclassmen, um, and, and so yeah, we'll we'll see if that Farmington can can start up on the right foot to get again to have that type of uh, seven six seven win season once again. And uh, tough matchup here in week one. Yep, moving down the way, Elmwood Brimfield versus Knoxville. So Mitch, we just called out these these last two matchups. And these are teams that in Farmington, Elmwood, Brimfield, Knoxville, possibly Illini West, that we all kind of anticipate being up in the mix potentially to win their side of the Lincoln Land Conference, them along with Mercer County. But Elmwood, Brimfield, and Knoxville, that, that's a marquee matchup in week one. Yeah. Um, talking about the Blue Bullets, they've, they've got some returners. They've got about half of their offense, half of their defense coming back. So I, I like that from a depth perspective um, and from an experience perspective. So it, uh, it'll be traditional Knoxville football, I think, running the ball, playing good defense. But a, a really tough El- Elmwood Brimfield team, also a playoff team last year. They're going to have really good team speed. And, again, this should be a really good – uh, knock them out, drag them out football game that we're used to seeing. So looking forward to uh, this game. I have this one marked as my uh, game of the week, so to speak, here in the conference. Yep. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Another game we're looking at, West Hancock at Hayworth. Hayworth was 2-7 and seven a year ago, and we've talked about West Hancock struggled a year ago as well, but new head coach Coy, Dor- Coy Dorothy has things kind of, you know, maybe building some momentum, maybe turning things around a little bit here. Can this new look Titans team Grab a win in week one. This seems like an opportunity. Yeah, I think so. Um, looking forward to what West Hancock can do um, here in week one. No question. Um, one and eight last year, right? So they got to start off on the right foot. But um, Coach Jordan, they said they're not going to look like anything like they did last year. So um, new schemes coming, and we'll see if that is ready to roll here in uh, week one. Yep. Let's move down one more game to cover on the big side of the Lincoln land. Lewistown will be at Macomb flipping over to the more traditional Lincoln trail side of things. You have a town at Princeville. So can a town turn things around? Also Princeville, they missed the playoffs a year ago by one game losing in week nine. So can they turn things around? They will be at home in that one. The princes will be, uh, we have South Fulton, Oh, going up against Anawan Weathersfield. So one of those new look kind of crossover games um, in the in the Lincoln Land Conference. It's an Anawan Weathersfield team, Mitch, that, hey, you're high on them. You, they're ready to go in week yeah. one here. Yeah, Ze- Zeb Rashid, Dylan Ori, Colin Hornback, um, and Landon Sauer. So names that I'll, I'll be calling out all year, I think, for the Titans. So looking forward to, to again, seeing seeing these guys on the field and seeing what they can do to follow up on a seven and three season uh, last year. Yep. We also have Mitch, the team I'm excited about this year. I'm also excited about Anawan Weathersfield, but you know, I, I, I like what Rova Williams field has going here. They open up against Havana against the Havana ducks. See if Rova Williams field can get off on the right foot, you know, with Riley Danner, Brian Bertel chauffeur, just a group that, you know, seems primed to make that next step. The last year, they seemed like they were knocking on the door. Yeah, seven starters back on offense. So this is going to be an explosive team to to follow and to watch. It'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, I think when you're looking at Rova Williams Field, what they have to do, I think a big part of it will come in controlling Braden Barner, versatile quarterback for Havana. He's back um, as a second-year starter, had 700 total yards, 11 touchdowns. He also made 70 tackles on defense. So a player to account for on both sides of the football for Havana. They were 4-5 and five a year ago. Head coach Colton Hammond there certainly has them hungry to get off on the right foot, try to make that push back to the playoffs. Mitch, last game in the Lincoln land, Rushville Industry at Stark County. You know, maybe we saved the best game for last year. This is the game that... When we were going through months ago, talking about the games that 
we th- we tweeted out would be the most interesting in each conference throughout the whole season. I thought this was a game in week one that will be one of those marquee matchups for the entire season. Um, it's certainly when we talk up uh, Rova, Williams Field, and, and Anwan Withers Field, we should not be so quick to not or, or, or we should not be so quick to count out Stark County because I think they're going to be right there too. I think they can really make some noise this season after um, coming off of a playoff year. They've got a lot of guys coming back. Uh, Luke Rewers coming back at quarterback had a, had a really great year, dual threat quarterback, um, and, and a lot of returning production. So can can the Rebels find the consistency that they've been looking for? Um, certainly in the run game for, for Rushville industry, they're, they're going to need to replace a lot of their rushing attack. Over 75% of their rushing is gone. They've got the wing tee installed there, so they can always do a lot of misdirection. Um, so can can the Rebels be disciplined on defense? Um, and we talked about Travis Gray there in Rush, Rushville industry, looking to see uh, <laughs> looking to see him running the ball this year at fullback. Yeah, the the Travis Gray experience is that what it was? What Chris Dewar coined it as? Yeah, him and his, him and his beautiful flowing locks of hair. <laughs> That's right. Not Chris Dewar's, but Travis Gray. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I, that wasn't a shot at Chris Dewar because I'm I'm losing my hair too. So I did I yeah. didn't mean that as an intended shot, but uh, no, I I just to me this matchup stands out as you know Stark County, like you said, has some pieces. They they have a shot to really contend in this conference, but it starts here. I think we kind of we're going to learn something about this Star County team in week one. You know, win or lose, there's still a lot of games left to be played. But I think you know, putting your best foot forward in week one very important. It'd be it would be a quality win for the Rebels team to get one over Rushville Industry and vice versa for Rushville. It would be a yep. quality win over this Star County team. And again. It's it's similar to what we talked about in the track. These are conference games right off the gate, right? So you got to kind of figure some things out quickly, you know, be ready to go. So so it's a lot of fun. And, you know, these conferences where there's not, you know, we like non-conference games. Don't get don't get me wrong, but it is fun to start week one where it's it's go time. You know, it's it's conference implications right from right from opening kick. So let's get into the Northwest Upstate Illini. Interesting matchup here in Dakota and Fisher. So Dakota, like we've discussed a little bit, has had a little bit of turmoil in the offseason. Uh, new coach Eric Didich had to step in, you know, last minute, you know, to take over right before the season started. But you're going up against a team in Fisher that did not field a varsity roster a year ago. So who gets off on the right foot, right? I mean, that's important for any team. But for these two stories in particular, it is really interesting here. Yeah, it it, it certainly is. And you wonder if Dakota has the right pieces to overcome that any sort of turmoil, like you mentioned, um, that, that that's, you know, that team is full of, of players who have been battle tested last year. They had a great run. Um, and, and I think that'll, that'll go a long ways when you're, when you're facing a team like Fisher, despite their great helmets, um, because they're, they're coming off of a year where they were off uh, like Riverdale, you know, getting things reset. So they'll have some things to figure out on, on their side too. So, yeah, um, we'll we'll see. I, I like Dakota to win, just that that classic NUIC football. So, uh, but it, looking looking forward to this one. Yep, yep. Well, the matchup, the next one we're going to talk about is the one that really stands out to me in Week One. Forreston, yep. Forreston hosting Fulton. So two playoff teams a year ago, two very good football teams a year ago, two teams that we expect to be in the mix, kind of year in and year out. This year's no exception. You know, can I guess the questions become can Forreston match up with the athlete like Balin Damehoff? You know, big, tall, wide receiver. What can they do to slow him down? You have Dom Kramer stepping in at quarterback for the Steamers. So can can they make that connection early and often? Kramer to Damehoff. That could be very dangerous for this steamer team. On the flip side of the ball for Forrest and Mitch, it's no secret. It's running the football. It's Caleb Sanders this year. It's Micah Nelson returning after missing some time last year. You know that that's what Forrest is going to do. They're they're going to get to the ground and they're going to they're going to pound it right down your throat. Right, and that, that's that could be their game plan to keep the ball out, out of of Baylen Damehoff's hands. Right, if, it, if the Seamers don't have the ball, they can't really do much with it. So, um, th- this will be a really really fun matchup I think I I think the key here with Forreston is that Micah Nelson comes back I think he only played in five games last year and he had 500 yards so 
a very, very good runner. Um, just another piece for this Cardinal offense, just what they needed, right? Another, another running back. So, um, yeah, th- th- we've, we've talked a lot about playoff implications in week one. This this game is certainly that. We'll see if both teams can really follow up on the successes that they had last year. And it's it's hard to believe, Greg, looking at it, is that Forreston has won three of the last eight Class, eight, class 1A titles. And just being in the NUIC – and playing alongside Lena Winslow, they just don't seem to always be talked about enough, but um, th- their goals this year are to win a state title. There, there's no doubt about it. And I, and I'm sure Fulton's are as well, certainly Get, getting back to the couple of state titles that they have, they'd like to add another one. So two classic programs here, similar color schemes, right? This will be a really, really fun game on, on Friday in Fulton. Uh, similar color schemes, but a sorry, new, um, similar colors, but a new look for Forrest in this year with the white helmet. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. What do we think about that? Um, I like it. Yes, you. I need to see it. I, I need to see it under the lights. Okay. Because it'll be different. It, it's they've they've had such that uh, traditional look with the red helmet. So, um, you know, certainly it'll help in this game. <laughs> so you don't have two red helmets going against each other. But <laughs> uh, I'm gonna hold my I'm gonna hold my judgment until I see some pictures of it in action. All right. Our our friends over at the Illinois Helmet Project had sent out the image that they mocked up for it, the graphic, yeah. and it looked fantastic. So that's what I'm basing my yeah. my my thoughts off of. So yeah. Yep. All right. Moving down the list, Galena at Eastland Pearl City. This is an Eastland Pearl City team that has been getting, you know, talked about a little bit. Kyle seems to like them. We've kind of been interested because they have a lot of returning production. And a team that was kind of, we felt like right there last year that they, you know, maybe were just a few plays away here or there from maybe making a playoff push or winning a few more games. Is this year they make that playoff push? They open against Galena, looking at the Pirates, running back Jack Reese. You know, can he get this, can he get his season started on a high note? I think that would go a long way in helping this Galena Pirates team. Yeah. Um, at EPC, like we talked about earlier with, with their, uh, traditions, um, coming down the hill, certainly hopefully going to set the tone, uh, for the Wildcats. And, and like you mentioned, is this the year that they can finally make that leap, um, to get back into the playoffs? This was a, a state championship team in 04, I think. So, um, they'll be very, very fast on, on both sides of the ball young up front, but we'll, we'll see again, if guys like Brady Switzer, um, who is is a first team all conference player last year? Same thing with um, with, with Ethan Petta as a as a receiver. So um, and on defense as well. So yeah, I I have high hopes for for EPC this year, and uh, Galena always a tough matchup. So yeah, looking forward to this game to seeing again which team um, can get on the right foot. And this is a conference who is sending a, a number of teams to the playoffs every year and every win matters. So for both of these programs uh, getting into the playoffs could very well come down to this game. Yes. Mitch Eastland Pearl city won a state championship in 2014. So 14, not 04, 14. There you go. So there you go. So yeah, I mean, and they were the year before that they were 10 and one um, a few years ago in 18, they were 12 and one. So yeah, they've had, you know, a handful of years where they've been a very dominant football team. So, uh, yeah, can, can they get back to the playoffs and kind of get that, you know, get that pride back? This this week, one win would be step in that right direction. So, well, speaking of speaking of dominant programs, Lena Winslow, they opened their season against West Carroll. Obviously, Mitch, we've talked a lot about it. The Panthers, they want to start fast. They, they're looking for the quest for the four-peat four state titles in a row that would really put themselves in very rare air in Illinois high school football. It's never been done in one. A. Well, yeah. Wow. Yep. There you go. Um, yeah. Look, what, what can we say about this? Right. You, you have a, a team that has won three straight titles against a West Carroll team that is, is still coming back from when they took their year off. So this, this was a, a, a an ugly game last year. So, um, but there, there is there's intrigue, right? How how different does Lena Winslow look? Uh, Coach Aaron said they needed to improve everywhere, which again yeah. um, I don't believe. But I'm not going to uh, <laughs> discredit what his what his mindset is either. And then for West Carroll, you know, 
tough, tough season last year, your first season back. So what do they look like in year two? Can they make some strides um, and learn some, um, le- learn who they're about in a, in a game like, like against Lena Winslow? Yep. Well, one more game to cover in the Northwest Upstate Illini. Dupec going up against Stockton. Mitch, thanks to our good friends at NUICfootball.com. You found a great little nugget on Stockton. Lay it, lay it on us here. Yeah, and look, I, I've never been short on my praise for Stockton um, and, and playing up there, and, and I've, I've always been a big fan of, of that Blackhawk program. But they rank 30th in all-time wins in IHSA history with 615. That is the best number amongst all NUIC teams and the most – wins of any team really in, in kind of the immediate area. So um, a team that hasn't had a lot of playoff success recently. Um, I think they were the team that won a state title in 04. I was thinking of, of VPC, but I was mixing it up. I think Stockton won in 04. Um, but a, a team that is looking to start getting back into that flow of playoffs every single year. So I, I think they can do it this year. Tough matchup here in week one against a really good Dupec team who I expect a lot from too. But um, for, for the Blackhawks, Kobe Tucker is a, is a new quarterback for them. They'll be running a multi-set offense. Um, how, how, how good is he at that? How ready is he for that in week one against a Dupec team who we've, we've seen their defense been so stingent over the, the past couple of years um, and, and complimentary of a really, really good offense. Yeah. I I'm excited to see what this Dupec team brings to the field you know they're a program that they've they've kind of proven themselves to be near the top of the conference and um you know i think that this stockton team has a chance to make some noise if they can you know pull one off you know pull off one of those games that maybe on paper you didn't expect that would go a long way to to help their season out yeah tough task for for a week one game against dupac i mean cooper cooper hoffman comes back as qb last year he almost through for a thousand yards, just under it, 14 touchdowns, 69% completion percentage last year. They do need to replace AJ Mulcahy, who we, who we know and talked about a lot last year. So um, maybe some new wrinkles for that, that Riverman offense. But um, I look for both of these teams to be playoff teams by the end of the year. And uh, we'll see who gets off on the, the first step to that path. I should say here in, in a week one matchup. Absolutely. Well, let's wrap this up, Mitch, with some talk of the eight-man matchups we have in week one. We'll look through the defending state champions. Uh, Biggsville, West Central, they go on the road to Flanagan, Cornell, Woodland. So uh, Flanagan, Cornell, Woodland last year was two and seven. So, you know, we there's a lot of unknowns surrounding this West Central program, but I think that this is a, you know, a game, this is a good starting point for them against the Flanagan team that's trying to find themselves as well, you know, trying to overcome and trying to improve their record. So that's where Uh they start. We'll move down the way. Galva is at home against West Prairie. You also have Ridgewood going on the road to Pawnee. So Ridgewood coming off an eight and one regular season a year ago, really excited to see what they can do um, this, this year. And, you know, is this the year that they maybe take the next step that they, you know, were, you know, almost there, right? Knocking at the door last year. Is this the year they can really break through? Let's keep going down the way here. Mitch, in the eight-man North Division Two, the the North Two Division, that's where we get a lot of our heavy hitters. You have um, Amboy hosting Decatur Unity Christian. That was the team that had Leighton Miller. He's transferred out. But this Amboy team is a team that we have a lot of high hopes for. Yeah, uh, certainly the the number one team, I think, according to NUIC football's rankings and and a team that made just one heck of a run last year, kind of being um, injury plagued a little bit. So this team at full strength should be really, really fun to watch. Yep. We also have Hanover River Ridge. The Wildcats will be on the road at Milledgeville. Milledgeville, that's another team with uh, head coach Jason Robel. They were six and three in the regular season last year. You know, what can they do to follow up that? This Milledgeville team has been in the mix in the eight-man ranks. Connor Nye back at quarterback, you know, he's a huge X factor. He's been an impact player for several years for this Missiles team. So can he get off on on the right start? We also have Orangeville will be hosting Ashton Franklin Center. And you have, last but not least, Polo 
will be hosting Peoria Heights. So Polo, a team that, you know, fell just short in that crazy finish to West Central. Where do they come back this year, you know, to, to kind of bounce back? That's a Polo team that's always been in the mix in the eight-man ranks. So can they get off to a good start against Peoria Heights? Um, you know, see what they can do to kind of set the tone in their, on their season. So, yeah, a lot of, a lot of good matchups there every week in, in eight man, um, as, as we've come to realize over the past couple of years. So, um, no, no different here in week one and, uh, we'll see what, uh, again, like we've talked about with all the teams and all the conferences that we've, that we've discussed tonight, um, seeing which teams have, have made a leap from last year and, and really what teams already have their identity going for them moving forward. So as, as we learn more and more uh, about each program. Yeah. So Mitch, are you all, uh, you ready to go? You're going to be on, be on the X, be on the Twitter on uh Friday night. Yeah. yeah. We'll be ready to go. Um, we'll, we'll have, uh, we'll, we'll have eyes in the sky. I'll see. <laughs> um, I'll have to see what, what streaming options we have uh, yep. available, um, for some local games. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be all over it. We'll be, we'll be providing updates throughout the night um, with, with scores and, and updates uh, through all the conferences and you'll be on the road and we'll, uh, we'll wrap everything up uh, certainly uh, by tuning into the score to see highlights and scores from, uh, from all over the viewing area or listening area, I should say. Yeah. For anyone in the quad cities, uh, you know, TV area, tune in to uh, WQAD. And even if you're not, you can watch on YouTube as well. I believe they'll be live on YouTube. So you know, yep. check them out. They do a full half hour show starting at uh, 1030. So it, it's great. It's a it's a really great product they put out there. So uh, make sure to check that out. I'll be out covering at least at, at least one game, probably two, probably end up at two different games. And I don't know exactly where I'm going yet. I, I have to nail that down. Yep. But I like some of those matchups in the three rivers. I think I'll end up in the three rivers athletic conference. So uh, anyway, right. should, should be a great night. Yes. Let me ask you something so the, the people at home know. Where's the best place on any of the interstates, back highways, small towns to get a big gulp? Oh, man, that's uh, that's a good question. So it's always really convenient to get one if you're late night after a game in Galesburg. There's a Circle K not far away from the high school. So that's always a good okay. polar pop run. You could get one right there. Um yep. My head also goes to similar to Alito. If you're leaving a game in Mercer County, there's a Polar Pop, a Circle K right, right in the middle of town. You could catch one there. Um, and Mitch, as you well know, there, there's a Casey's in, in, in several, in plenty of small towns. So yeah. well, it's, it's not so much that the city has them. It's just the convenience factor too, because uh, you're always in a hurry, right? Yeah. So it's always uh, location- uh next to the highway next to the school so you know like morrison like the casey's is nowhere near the school so that doesn't help us very often so um that's yeah, true you know, it's yep i'm just curious to know where uh that you know where you're gonna go no matter what game you're going to that week that you know where you're gonna stop for, uh, <laughs> so for substance. so usually i can stop and grab one that you know kind of you know a look behind the scenes at wqad there's usually a polar pop run in the afternoon um, when I worked there full time, I was, you know, getting that polar pop run with, with the, with, with the rest of the crew. Now that I'm not there in the afternoons, I'm usually going to grab a polar pop on my way to the station to kind of meet up with the guys and then get on my way. A lot of times I'll just yep. stop and get a polar pop and then be on my way. I won't even stop at the station. So, right. you know, priorities, I'd rather get my polar pop than see Dazzo, of course. So. Is, is there is there a, a game day snack that you also grab there at this at the store? I to? you know a lot of times if I just need a snack, just like give me like some peanut M, peanut butter M and M's, something to mm -hmm. something to munch on in the car, um, maybe chips or something. But I all sure. you know you gotta save room for a pork chop at a game if you can if you can right. get one when you're running out. So yeah, yep, yeah. that's right. Mitch, this Good is point. the important insights that we're, you know, the people are here for. So I'm glad we got into that. I think I think a lot of people would be would be interested to watch uh, behind the scenes of how yeah. a Friday night is produced. I mean, and certainly back when we did it, you know, technology has advanced so far. But I mean, you know, I, I think you said that you can edit from your car now and send it in, which back in the day, 
it was not like that at all. No, that did and not exist. Yeah. The wildness of, of how a show like that is produced, I think would interest a lot of people because I guarantee that no one has any idea what goes into it. Well, yeah, I get looks, you know, when I'm sitting in my car and the game's over and a lot of people are leaving and I'm just sitting in the car yeah. with the door, maybe propped open a little bit to get some air flowing in there. And I'm just yeah. editing, sending back. But I will say, if I can cut out the stress of driving back, you know, knowing I have to edit in a, in a rush, in a cram, it is nice to just get that sent back, get on the road, nice leisurely drive home. You, you know, I could give you yeah. a call when I'm on the interstate and talk about the game. Right. So yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not flying down 88 <laughs> Sterling to get, yeah. to, to get back to the studio before, before 10, 15. I've done that a few times. So yeah. yeah. Right. But uh <laughs> And Mitch, we need to get uh, we need to get Casey's General Store or a Circle K on board as a sponsor. I don't I don't know I don't know the yeah. I don't know the end roads to make that happen, but we got to look into that because yeah. I, I am add certainly them, add them, yeah add them to the list to Illinois Park producers because we got to get them <laughs> at some point too. So that's right. I want that's that right. I to speak that into fruition. That's right. All right, Mitch, that's all we got. We'll uh, we'll be in touch this week for sure to all our listeners. If you haven't already, go out and check out our conference previews. They're all available in the archives. They're all ready to go for you. You can find them on YouTube. You can find them on Podbean or anywhere you listen to podcasts. That'll get you all set to go with this uh, podcast as well, this episode. We got you squared away. We're ready for week one, Mitch. I'm, I'm ready to get out there. I'm ready for hopefully not as hot. Hopefully a nice, calm fall evening. I, I'm ready for that. I can't wait. Yeah, the, the sights, the sounds, the smells, everything. Uh, it, it's back um, and looking forward to covering it all year with you. Yeah, well, the next time the next time that we talk to uh, all of you, we will uh, be talking about results and games on the field. So it is exciting times. We will talk to everyone next week. That'll do it for this week's episode of View from the West. Thank you so much for listening. I encourage you to go out to Apple Podcasts or Podbean and subscribe so you can follow along and downloads will come automatically every week. You can follow along on Twitter at ViewFromWestPod. You can also email me if you're interested in being a sponsor, ViewFromWestPod at gmail.com. Thanks so much. We'll see you next week.